Nine News was there as he emerged from quarantine just days before his first trip to court. Ryan Houston back in Sydney, the holiday well and truly over. Back in Australia for the court case? I'm um, back in Australia, I live in Australia, thank you. Brian comes home and really starts what I call a non-apology tour, doing everything in his power to resurrect his brand outside of this. Well, hi there. I pray you're doing well. I want to be clear. The media and others incorrectly say I resigned because I breached the Hillsong Code of Conduct, but that was not true. I didn't resign because of my mistakes. I resigned because of the announcements and statements that had been made which Bobby and I felt made my position untenable. And I spelled out my reason. Not only does he not apologize, he goes fully on the defensive. The narrative that I'm an alcoholic is false. In fact, I've been told by an expert therapist that I do not display the behaviors that are typical of an alcoholic. And the notorious night in 2019, where I met the double dose of anti-anxiety tablets with alcohol, was a one-off occasion. <laughs> ah, it's great to be here. You know what? I love this church. Too. Brian is trying to maintain a tenuous struggling act. On the one hand, he faces this really serious charge at the court. Alleged concealment of alleged child sex offences. But on the other hand, he's trying to rehabilitate himself as a preacher. We've had a big challenge with the seats because some unhinged and childish people kept serving fake seats. People are harder on people than God is. By far. Cancel culture will write you off, but God won't write you off. After Brian was forced out, he started to go against Hillsong. He decried the way he was forced to resign, and how Bobby was terminated. They committed to a new strategy and painted themselves as victims. I think the hardest part to understand for Bobby and I, and the most difficult part, Bobby's termination. When Bobby got fired, they all were very shocked. And I'm like, you just did the exact same thing to me. This is your church, like, this is what you built, and your culture, like, I don't know what else they expected. I've been humble, but I'm not living poor, and I'm not living disgraced. I'm living as a child of God, with my head held high, chosen, called, graced, and with a God-given future and hope. Okay, good morning, everybody. Had about 12 people here. Now you're probably like, what in the heck is this? All right, let me explain this to you. All right, this is the last 20 minutes or so, give or take, of a four-part documentary series that was recently played on FX that is now streaming on Hulu called Secrets of Hillsong. And I had to watch all four hours to get the full context of, of everything here so I can explain it to you all. And um, I'll tell you why this is so important now as we go on today. But right now, let me just kind of give you some background, okay? I always knew that Hell Song, okay, I was called a Hell Song because, and I didn't really know why other than to kind of be funny, and I knew that it was bad from the get-go. I just, I just knew that. But I didn't know how bad. I didn't know how deep the corruption was. I didn't know, you know, uh, I knew about Carl Lentz. Okay, the rock star preacher from New York, or that had um, led Hillsong, New York. And I knew he was Justin Bieber's pastor and so forth. And he was like a rock star celebrity preacher. And I, I knew about all that. So that gave me pause automatically, of course. And I knew about the music. Most people probably knew about the music, but maybe didn't know about the, um, you know, the church itself. Uh, so anyway, this documentary comes out, which is really interesting timing because over the last, oh, I, I don't know how many years, maybe eight, probably less than that, really, um, 
hell song has been like at the top you know as far as the mega churches go but now everything is coming to light as we know our god is not mocked what we sow we will reap your sins will find you out <laughs> and that is exactly what is happening now so what you're seeing right now okay and ignore the ads, please. I can't control those. All right. So if you see something that's highly offensive to you or whatever, just kind of cover your eyes, whatever. Trust me. I, I get it. All right. And I will say this, too. Some of the dialogue in here and the things, the, the, the content is not appropriate for kids. I made the stream appropriate for kids so people could comment. But it's not. Okay. I would say if you have children or grandchildren in the room, they may not want, you may not want them to see some of this. Or hear about some of this it's disturbing and um, I'd say probably 15 and up would probably be okay but anyway because it's rated TVMA the documentary because of the content some language and so forth but anyway getting back to this what you're seeing now and what's being reported on is an ongoing investigation and I can't remember exactly when it started. I want to say it's around 2018, 2020. Don't quote me on that. I'm not exactly sure. But basically, it came to it came to some investigative reporters' attention at Vanity Fair, as well as in Australia, which is where Hellsong originated from. If people didn't know that it all came from Australia. That there were uh, there was impropriety, moral failings, but even worse than that. Uh, sexual allegations, you know, sexual abuse allegations, uh, you know, pr uh, extramarital affairs, um, just these people not cracked up to what they claim to be. And so that's what you're seeing now. The dude with the Australian accent, if people didn't know him, kind of reminds me of a, a Star Wars <laughs> villain, you know, like, if people are familiar with that, like Count Dooku, weird name, but the actor Christopher Lee played this character, this dark Lord of the Sith, Count Dooku, you know. <laughs> That's who this Brian Houston guy reminds me of, the founder of, of the modern day Hell Song, you know, with his, you know, he's got his Australian accent, which is not a problem, you know, but just the way he presents himself, the way he speaks, he reminds me of a Star, a Star Wars villain, you know. And it, it reminded me, I was reminded, you know, in the, the, if people are not familiar, if you are, then ignore it. But in the last um, episode of, you know, that was released in theaters, uh, the Star Wars saga it was called uh, Revenge of the Sith. And there was a, a scene in the movie where Anakin, who later becomes Darth Vader, you know, um, has to face Count Dooku, who previously had taken his arm in a lightsaber battle or whatever, and when in the process there when they're dueling, Anakin basically brags on himself and says, "My my uh, my uh, powers have doubled since the last time we met, Count." And then he goes, "Good, something like something that's nature good." He goes, "Twice the pride, twice the fall." Well. <laughs> like I said, this dude reminds me of a Star Wars villain. He pretends to be your friend, but he's a man master manipulator and a great deceiver. And as this goes on, you'll you'll see that more. And I'll I'll, I'll pause it at times to introduce you to certain people, so you kind of know who they are. If you don't have the opportunity to watch this whole thing, like I said, it's four hours long. So uh, you know it's. Uh, streaming now and uh each segment is a little over an hour and there's four different episodes and this last episode that concludes everything is actually called false prophets which i i find very appropriate so anyway let me get through the ads go back to it and then um and then, like i said i'll pause it at times to kind of explain to you what's going on because you have to pretty much watch all four hours to understand the last 20 minutes. So I'll, I'll do my best to summarize. All right, let me go get past these ads. I, like I said, I can't control the ads. Um, I can't skip them or anything like that. So just ignore them. Like I said, if it's offensive, turn your head, whatever. 
I'll just uh, mute them. These aren't so bad right now, but other ones, good grief. <laughs> And being that this is what they refer to as Pride Month, this is very appropriate, and I'll explain that further as we go on. Because his trial will commence this month in June, which I find very, very interesting. Brian Houston's trial, trial I'm talking about. Hellsong has pretty much been dismantled, disintegrated. I mean, there are a few satellite churches here and there, but they don't nearly have the uh, congregants they once had, nor the pull. Most people, they're pretty upset. They're pretty angry. And they'll, they'll get into that toward the end of the documentary. And the wake of bodies and souls that these people have left, have, have left is just it's traumatic. It's horrible. It's devastating to a lot of people. Today, Hillsong founder Brian Houston appeared in court to begin his defense. If he is found guilty, he could be up to five years jail. I had a lot of people asking how I'd like to get to in this court hearing. I thought, what a great opportunity to try and track every day. It just makes sense for me to see this to the end. Check out here. Okay, this guy Jacob, he was a former member of Hellsong Australia and one of the whistleblowers because he was seeing things, hearing about things he didn't like. And so he brought it to people's attention. And, you know, at first it seemed pretty minor, but then the more the investigative recorders delved into it, the more they found. Um, not only sexual abuse allegations, uh, pastors groping church members, you know, youth group leaders groping youth girls, things of that nature. Um, but it was even deeper than that, and they'll get into it. I mean, this goes back to the 70s. This goes back to the founding of this organization, which it was never really a church. It was an organization. It was a business like I told people about in the last video I made the long haul. For a lot of people, this is big business. I didn't know how deep this went until I watched this documentary. But that's exactly what's going on here. For these false prophets, these wolves in sheep clothing, these hirelings, this is big business. It's all about the money. So there's a malfeasance. There's a lot of money being stolen, uh, laundered, misallocated. All these things, this guy is one of the main whistleblowers, Jacob here. And then the two gentlemen he was talking to, they are from Vanity Fair magazine, and they were kind of the ones that broke the story. And then you'll see another investigative reporter from Australia uh, soon as well. Loyalties have shifted since the Royal Commission days. Brian all of a sudden finds himself alone. Okay, the Royal Commission. This is very interesting. Australia has a different type of court system called the Royal Commission. It's kind of more like a tribunal. And at the time, Brian Houston pretty much had these guys the first time around. Okay, this has been going on for several years now. He kind of had these guys in his pocket. Not anymore. Not anymore. You know, no honor amongst thieves kind of thing. And he was actually personal friends with Scott Morrison, who was the prime minister, I don't know if he still is or not, of Australia, who visited the church and this and that. And, you know, and of course, Brian Houston and Helson, they from Australia during the, you know, the Trump regime, they were all here for that, praying over him. And, you know, they were all buddy, buddy, you know, birds of a feather kind of thing, you know. And so the Royal Commission this time around has been embarrassed. They're angry, they're upset. He's not, they're, they're, they're not friends any longer because this guy has been lying to everybody, including his friends, and now he's been caught. I was quite surprised to see Brian without bodyguards or his elders. 
his wife was there, one of his daughters was there. No bodyguards. Imagine that. Uh, so what, what was the defense's argument? Essentially it was, well, Brian didn't know and anyone could report to the police. Brian is not the only one. You know, half a dozen of the top Pentecostal people in Australia also knew and at least two very senior some people that we know of. So this court case involving Brian might not be the last. It's almost like it's hard going out and seeing which fish we're going to get caught. Brian actually said, Hazel is not a new about Brett Sam You can hear a pin drop. Okay. Now I have to back up, who okay. cares? This guy here, that's Frank Houston. He's the founder of Hell Song. It was originally called like Hish Hill Christian Valley Church or something like that way back in the 70s. Actually, let me, let me back up. That's Frank the pedophile Houston. This is his wife, Hazel, okay? Everybody thought that Miss Hazel here was some kind of a saint, right? That everything that Frank was doing behind the scenes and he abused about 13 children, I think is what they say at the end, um, 13 victims. And uh, some of them tell their story, at least two. And Brett Singstock, who you'll see soon, was the first of his victims. And then there was another man uh, that they interviewed throughout the, um, throughout the documentary. I can't recall his name right now, David something, I believe. But anyway, very sad story because what would happen is um, Pastor Frank here, pedophile Frank, would go to uh, certain congregates' homes and then while everybody's downstairs playing cards or drinking coffee or maybe having a Bible study or whatever, he would go up to the children's rooms and he would visit the children and he would fondle the children. That's what good old Frank would do here. So Brian Houston is, uh, Frank's dead I think probably in hell. But anyway, Brian Houston is basically answering for the sins of the father. Okay, which says that doesn't sound fair. However, he knew he was protecting good old dad all these years. And now it appears that Sister Hazel here, the wife of the pastor, the wife of the pedophile pastor, she knew. So see, it's all in the family. I'll get into more of that later on. How Hellsong recruits their rock star pastors, has them set out the set up these satellite churches, and deceive, I guess, millions of people. So now it's <clears throat> excuse me, all coming to light. So you're gonna hear more about Frank the pedophile here, but they're gonna talk about his wife at first because nobody could believe that this sweet, loving woman knew all of this stuff and never said anything. And now it's all coming to light. She knew. I actually felt sick hearing that because a lot of people in Hillsong have such a high regard for Hazel Houston. She was such a bedrock um, in the early days. I actually was upset for Brian. I was upset to, to see how he had to speak of his mother that way. I feel a great sadness, I feel a great maybe moral responsibility, but in terms of feeling like, um, you know, that I, I, I somehow personally responsible, or even at, at church is ultimately responsible, I, I don't, I mean, the, the morality of it is a different issue, the legal issue. I don't for one moment think that... That's Brett Singstock. Anywhere near the level of the, he was uh, abused as a little, as as a little boy. Up. about what my own personal father did to us. What was Brett Sengstock's testimony like? It was actually really hard to sit through. It was incredibly hard watching the defense really starting to go after his memory. It was remarkable for someone like Brett Sengstock to hold his ground. So the trial hasn't yet finished. It's recommencing 2023, June. I'm going to do everything in June 2023. Imagine that. This month. When I think about 
Dutch, the, the French. Okay. This woman here, Marilyn Brett, and her husband, I believe his name is Kevin Brett. Kevin and Brian basically started modern day hell song together. They changed the church's name because a man by the name of Jeff Bullock, who was uh, basically responsible for all of the music that Hellsong put out, at least in the earlier days, he suggested that they change the name because it would just sound better for advertising, marketing purposes, you know, to put the music out. The church, it just sounded better than Hill Christian Valley Church or whatever they wanted to call it or whatever they had it called before. So this woman and her husband personal friends of the Houstons, Brian and Bobby Houston. And they basically started everything together. Now, her daughter is Laura Lentz. Her daughter is the wife of Carl Lentz, who was the rock star preacher in New York. Like I said, Justin Bieber's uh, pastor, Selena Gomez, other celebrities people may be familiar with. I guess he was also the chaplain of the New York Knicks. I didn't know that. So when this guy was like, the Joel Osteen, basically, of Hillsong, Hillsong in New York, it was Carl Lentz. People might remember hearing about him on the news or whatever. Well, he, he fell from grace with an extramarital affair, and it all got exposed and came out into the open and so forth. So this hireling was, was exposed. And so this woman, Marilyn, is basically telling some of her side of the story here um, because it's all in the family. So Carl Lentz was actually recruited from Hellsong College by Brian Houston to start up Hellsong New York, okay? And then, of course, in the process, he meets Laura, this woman's daughter, who, as I said, who is, these people are the co-founders of Hellsong. See how that works, you know? And he marries her because, you know, all these young pastors have to be married, right? And not saying he doesn't love her or they don't love each other. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that that's just how it worked. And then um, Joel Houston, who is Brian Houston's son, was the one that introduced Carl to Brian. And then Brian's just like, oh, man, this guy, he's just enthralled with Carl at the time because Carl's very charismatic, good-looking guy. You know, he could definitely, you know, grab people's attention, you know, and said, you know, he's really built, you know, wearing leather jackets, you know, looking real cool on stage. Everything everybody wanting a pastor, right? You know, especially people who've been hurt by church, you know, previously, maybe they're searching, finding, trying to find a way or place to belong or whatever. Everybody was welcome at Hellsong. The problem is, you know, it was like, come as you are, but it was almost like, stay as you are, too. You know, so, you know, come as you are, but we're not going to do anything to help you to grow or, you know, to tell you you have to repent, to tell you you need to, you know, come to Jesus or anything of that nature. Just a bunch of padlum, just a bunch of motivational speaking for the most part. No substance there at all. So, again, now it's all coming to light. It's all coming out in the open. Just in time for this month. That we've had with Brian and Bobby, the great times that we've had being connected to Hillsong. All That's these Laura. Years. It's just a, a sense of sadness, particularly the way Laura was treated. She lost friends, she lost position, she lost everything. See, Carl cheated on Laura. The journal starts November 21st, which is 20, 2020. It's funny to look back at it. Listen to what Everyone she says. Knowing my personal painful story is the toughest part. Makes me angry. I'm hurt by my husband for putting us in this position and hurt by Hillsong. I've sacrificed a lot for the church. So yeah, I'm mad at God. I deserve to be loved, cherished, appreciated, and cared for, and he changed our story. So she's mad at God. He changed their story. Now they live in Sarasota, Florida. They pretty much escaped from New York, went down to Sarasota. I'm going to fast forward some of this because it's not important, really. What's really happening here is the family's getting together. Carl and Laura... 
pretty much back together now. These are their daughters, so the family's just kind of having a meal. Her in law, her parents are there. Carl made some really bad choices and made some really bad decisions along the way. Look. All right. So basically, Carl has gotten counseling, and he has um, basically tried, he's trying, let's just put it that way, according to this documentary. And that's what she's talking about. She says, Where? Hold on a second. She says that, uh, you know, because he is trying and because he's, you know, gotten counseling and so forth, and for their daughter's sake, you know, their family has kind of got gotten back together. Carl seems to be very repentant and contrite. But at the same time, he knows that he's left a lot of victims in his wake. And there's nothing he can do about it. Thousands, if not millions of people throughout the world that was following this organization, being led by these cult leaders, are hurt. They're devastated. They, their families, and you'll hear some of their testimony here soon. They're devastated. Some of them have completely lost their faith. They don't trust God. They don't believe God. They hate God. Some of them, have, one of them says he's a happy atheist. Um, they're angry. They're upset. Uh, and it all goes back to pedophilia, and which has, happens to do with this month, of course, because the LGBT agenda satanic agenda you know the plus part you know is map right minor attracted persons you know because they try to put a spin on it make it sound real positive and everything right but basically it's giving people permission to abuse children and they're saying oh they can't help it you know yes you can you pervert you know it's like oh i can't help that i'm attracted to a child yes you can you sodomite you know but you don't want to help it that's the bottom line so this whole organization started in corruption. It was founded in corruption. It was founded in pedophilia. And you find out through the documentary that Carl Lentz himself was actually abused as a child. They always go after the boys. These pastors, they always go after the boys. You do hear about the girls sometimes, but most of the time it's the boys. And they ruin these men. They absolutely ruin them. And now, you know, so I'm not making excuses for the man, and, and nor should anybody. And he doesn't make excuses for himself. I mean, he was a hireling. He knew what he was getting himself into. And he lived high on the hog for a long time, you know. But now he comes crashing down. But the interesting thing is he works for some advertising company in Sarasota, Florida. And, I mean, it's not like they're hurting. I mean, they got a nice house, nice closed-in patio here. He's driving a Dodge Charger. It's not like he's hurting or anything, right? And, you know, he talks about how some people have recognized him and talked about how, how, fall he's, how, how far he's fallen and so forth. Um, but, he, he, but he, you know, he, he's working for some type of advertising agency. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I'm not judging the man. You know, he could be very repentant and contrite, but some of the things he says doesn't sit well. Like, well, I was advertising the gospel. He said, so why shouldn't I be in advertising now kind of thing? You know, so it's like these people use their cult of personality and their charisma to continue and further their careers. And who can fault him for, you know, having a job to take care of his family? But it's just interesting to me. It's like how contrite and repentant are you, even though he does seem that way in the interviews, when you can still kind of joke about this. But they do. They say they say they're around the table here, we're a dark humor family. And it's like, like I said, I mean, you have to watch it all in its full context to, to understand. But the bottom line is a lot of people are hurt. A lot of people are angry. They're mad at God. You know, they're forgiving Carl, but they can't forgive the but they but they they hate God or they're angry at God and you know and I mean they're not going to the Lord for forgiveness you know or they're not going to the Lord I should say for to heal their hurt and their pain you know they're just kind of stewing in their anger for the most part and um, it's really sad 
you know, the, what these hirelings, these the people take exception to me calling people cult leaders. I know because I've gotten a lot of messages about that. They're angry about it. They're mad. They're mad at me. They, they're, you know, and I'm like, well, you know what? Maybe your beef isn't with me. Maybe it is. But maybe it's not with me. Maybe it's because the Holy Spirit is convicting you because you're following a cult leader. Maybe. Maybe you should stop listening to some of these clowns, these hirelings, these wolves in sheep's clothing, all these people that are making you feel good and promising you the world and not delivering on anything, you know, telling you that Jesus is coming back here and here and here and when and how and all this other stuff and never delivering anything, you know, giving you date and timeline after date after timeline and nothing ever comes of anything. Maybe you should stop following cult leaders. Maybe. You know, get mad at me and other people if you want to for exposing this, for bringing it to light, for making, for bringing an awareness if you want to. That, that's up to you. But maybe the Holy Spirit is convicting you to stop following cult leaders. Maybe you should just not trust a noun, a person, place, or thing. You know, just trust Jesus. Be obedient to Jesus. Do what he tells you to do. Okay? And just read the word. Stop listening to people, you know. There are a few I listen to, but very, very few. And I'll, I'll get into that later, you know, visions and dreams and whatnot, you know, because look at the devastation and the damage and the pain these people have caused. And yeah, they're trying to recover and come together as a family or whatever, but what about the victims? And he says, all I can do is apologize, you know, I'm sorry for all the people I hurt and try to be better. And he's right to a certain extent. But at the same time, you'll hear about the damage here soon that they've caused. Should we pray? <laughs> Me and Laura are a work in progress, but we're still here. <laughs> and do you feel this has obviously affected your relationship with God? Probably more. And so, um, I understand why some people would have walked away from, from what happened with me. I'm just super grateful for those that didn't, and I'm super grateful that my circle of five is intact. the ads aren't so bad so far today so anyway this is almost done but they're going to interview the people that have been hurt one of them's an iraq war veteran uh others were involved in a praise and worship team um they were promised a seat at the table they got nothing now some of them were paid like i say i think like 188 dollars a day to be in the praise and worship to compose and and play the music, write the music, and so forth. What well, doesn't sound bad, right? But keep in mind, they lived in New York City, and they were working like 12 to 14 hours a day to write and compose all of this wonderful hell song music that we have today, right? And they never got a seat at the table. They don't get royalties. They don't get anything for their hard work. 
Helsan was basically based on volunteerism from the very beginning. It was like an honor to volunteer at the church. It was an honor to be a roadie. It was an honor to set things up and so forth, especially when it was first beginning and they had to rent out places and things of that nature. And, um, you know, before they had their own place kind of thing. So it was an honor to be a volunteer. And so they would even fire volunteers. I mean, these people were just unbelievably arrogant. Do you think Carl has paid for what he did? In terms of healing for his congregants, for his flock, there are thousands of people that... This is Alex French. He's one of the lead investigators from Vanity Fair. I posted this on Instagram in April 2021. This church really... Okay. Hold on. Exclamation points. But... This is Mary French and her daughter, I believe daughter, might be granddaughter, Ashley French. So that's Mary and that's Ashley. And she was basically the mama, the spiritual mother of Hellsong, New York. Personal friends with Carl, um, spiritual leader type woman, mentor to a lot of other ladies and so forth. I believe that she the true follower of Jesus, and I just think she got suckered in, like a lot of other people do. So she's talking about this Instagram post she posted saying that things need to be changed at Hellsong, or it just needs to be shut down completely. Now her daughter or granddaughter isn't as forgiving, because she was on the praise and worship team, promised a seat at the table that she never got, and now she doesn't even believe that church needs to even have God or Jesus or anything in it. Basically just a social gathering where people can love each other and because it's all about love, right? It doesn't even need God or Jesus, just people coming together and loving each other because they're hurt. They're hurt and they're angry. And like I said, the devastation is just, is exactly that. So this is what she posted on her Instagram. Could have done like 40. In fact, it needs to be taken down and rebuilt on a true, not Brian Houston, Jesus Foundation. Brian Charles Houston created and grew the culture Carl and others were nurtured in. So what do you expect is gonna come out of it? If you plant things in rotten soil, then you're gonna have rotten fruit. I'm sorry. The reason I'm doing this is because I wanna see one of two things happen. I wanna see change, or I wanna see Hillsong shut down. That's Carl, Carl back in the day. And I didn't have a problem so much with Carl. I didn't know a whole lot about what was became going on a hippie. Carl's life. My problem was with Hillsong, period. Hillsong is the last church that I will ever go to this side of heaven. Okay, this man is an Iraqi war veteran. He was looking for a place to belong. And he thought he found it. He also had a great, um, how do I say it? He also had a, uh, a great passion as well as a talent for music, for writing music, composing music. And he never got that seat at the table. Now, Hell Song is pretty much disbanded. They went from like thousands of congregants to down to like 500 or something now, which I'm surprised there's even that many. But anyway. These people, these are the bodies, these are the souls left in the wake of all of this devastation. I don't consider myself a Christian anymore. I don't know the answers to the deeper questions in life, and it's not so existentially terrifying to me anymore. I actually find peace and just be like, I don't know. Once I got further and further away from the church, I just found out for myself that I don't think any of it's real, and it's beautiful if people believe in it, but for me, it's, it's not me. I'm a really happy uh, atheist. Happy atheist. Wow. It's been four years now. This woman was promised a pastoral ship. And whatever thing people think about women pastors or whatever, I'm not going to get into all that. But the bottom line is, she was promised a seat at the table, a pastoral ship. These were all Hellsong college students or people that joined Hellsong and were promised and 
you know, success, prosperity, whatever, and nothing was ever delivered. And now, and she never got her pastoral ship or anything. Since I stopped in her church, there was no way that I was going to continue to betray myself. People deserve better than that. People deserve to have an actual community. Pretty much all ended in 2018. scale is hard. I let down genuinely a lot of good people. And I can only apologize to change. My story is now one of recovery. And it hasn't been without failure. You know, that's what it, it's not like we're on this road um, and all of a sudden, you know, we're magically, our family's perfect, I'm good. So it's a pretty humbling road to be on every day. When your church sort of turns inside out and you see how much it was built around the benefit of an individual rather than this quote-unquote mission and vision that you've signed yourself up for. Yeah, this illusion that's... He's crazy. a writer and a podcaster. Church that was involved in investigation. Right now. Um, I don't know what I'm doing I'm getting better. I still can't sing. I haven't... I don't think I've said a word in church in a year and a half. Um... And I know God knows my heart, <laughs> and he knows where I'm at, and I know it's a process, um, and it makes me sad, because uh, I love the church, I love um, what I was a part of, but I see a lot of unhealthiness in church life as well now, because I'm out of it. Um, things that I didn't realize were unhealthy or like um, manipulative. And I don't think that's God's heart and I don't think that's what Christianity is supposed to be. For any evangelical community, there needs to be a recentering. Caitlin Beatty, Faith and Culture War writer. Over and against strategy and metrics and success <laughs> and the numbers game. What if you took a year and instead of counting attendance on Sundays, instead of counting conversions, measure success based on how the church is showing up in times of real crisis, crisis of life, crisis of loss, crisis of suffering. I think if the church wants to look at like how do we how do we avoid the, the pain of this stuff in the future? Really look to why people thought the church mattered. Your family's supposed to, you know, give your kids their guidance and where they're supposed to go, and church is just a bonus. And I feel like we have that twisted a little bit. You have to be at every service, every Sunday, otherwise, you know, you're, you're your life would fall apart. I just disagree with that kind of mentality. And I think there's more to church than just a building. But now more than ever, I really, I really see that. My spirituality today. Okay, this woman, <clears throat> she has a very sad story. I witnessed this myself actually years ago, but what she, uh, what happened with her is Back in like the late 70s, early 80s, um, she was a member of the Hill Christian Valley thing before it became Hellsong. And uh, they, she got pregnant as a teenager. And looking for help and hope in her situation, uh, she went to the church leadership. And uh, instead of trying to help and encourage, you know, they humiliated her. They basically made her wear the scholar, scarlet letter, so to speak, because they believed that she needed to go in front of the congregation and the youth group and whatnot. And uh, I guess her boyfriend was involved in this too. And basically go up and admit their sins and ask for forgiveness. And, uh, you know, 
basically she had to wear the scarlet letter is what it boiled down to. There was no love, there was no, you know, help or anything of that nature. Um, very sad story. I witnessed the exact same thing when I was, wow, I was very young. I, I was, um, I was going to a Christian school and it was a, um, in San Antonio at the church that we attended for a period of time. And I was like 11 years old, but the school was like a combination of elementary as well as junior and high school. I guess it was junior and, and junior school, high, junior high school at that time, as well as high school. And then um, a, a woman, a young lady, so about 17, 18 years old, um, she got pregnant. And the same thing happened to her. They brought her in front of the church. I was, like I said, I was like 11 years old. I witnessed this whole thing, and basically put on the scarlet letter, made her wear the scarlet letter, and humiliated her. And she was never seen again, as far as I know. I think she might have even dropped out of high school. I don't remember. I, I she was too embarrassed. At least, at least dropped out of our school. Uh, maybe she attended somewhere else. When I said I was like an 11 year old kid. I just thought it was horrible. Even at as 11 years old, I was like, hey, this is terrible to do this to a person. But this is what happens in a lot of self righteous, high and mighty, pious churches. You know, if we even want to call them that. So, yeah, so her story is, is, is very heartbreaking what happened to her. And she talks about her relationship with the Lord now. It's very much a personal thing now. It's not connected to full church. It's not connected to a place. It's not connected to anything in particular uh, other than myself. Okay, this guy, this is really interesting. He, he's, um, he's gay. Uh, he found out that he was basically gay in high school. He was raised uh, by a traveling evangelist father who basically uh, thought that homosexuals were like murderers. And so this young man um, finds out, you know, basically, I don't know how you want to say it, but he is attracted to other young men in high school he realizes that and he becomes a part of hell song because they accept him for who he is of course and love is love and nobody wants to you know talk to him about homosexuality and what he's struggling with and dealing with or anything of that nature and so they bring him in and they accept him and they offer miss they, they he thought he was going to get offered a seat at the table as well a lot of these people were congregants and they were and a lot of them were students. Hellsong has a college, like I said, where they groom people and they teach them to be pastors or if they're chosen, you know, then to lead, then they get that opportunity. Well, this guy was hurt really bad because back in Hellsong's heyday, I guess this all ended like 2018, I guess, but like around 2012 or something like that is when it was really popular you know, in the U.S. Uh, might have even been before that, but I think Carl Lentz kind of came on the scene in 2012. Well, he attended Hillsong, New York, and he and his boyfriend got an opportunity to go on the show Survivor and as a gay couple, of course, and he goes to Carl, Carl because he doesn't want to embarrass the church or anything like that, and he's not exactly sure, sure what the church's stance is on homosexuality and and you know and so carl's like oh yeah that'd be great yeah you, you, you go ahead and do that you know you be who you are we accept you no matter what kind of thing well this is what happens when you have you know so many in a business you know satellite organizations i guess you know franchises or whatever they're not all communicating and nobody really has a mission statement or if they do have the mission statement, they don't understand it or they go against it or what have you. And even though they have all of these people sign non-disclosure agreements in the leadership of the, of the so-called church, 
Well, Carl decides he wants to do his own thing, and then that gets back to Brian, and he says, oh, no, this is terrible for business. This is bad. And Brian Houston comes out with a statement saying, you know, we believe marriage is between a man and a woman and everything. And this guy, in the meanwhile, is going on Survivor, the show Survivor, with his boyfriend, talking about how he's a member of Hellsong and, you know, and how much he loves the church and this and that, and how they accept everybody and, you know, come as you are kind of thing. And, um... Uh, which kind of reminds me of the Ramana song, Come As You Are. But anyway, come as you are, but, and they're not going to try to change you. They're not going to pray the gay away, or they're not going to tell you that you need to change anything in your life or anything thing of that nature. And it blows up in their faces. And it's where he's hurt, of course, and he's embarrassed and humiliated because Carl has to come out and if he wants to keep his job and retract his statement and basically come against homosexuality after he had said that they had supported it. <laughs> Eventually, Carl winds up getting fired because of his extramarital affair. They fire his wife, Laura, because you can't have the one pastor without the other female pastor. So they come up with some type of reasoning. I can't even remember what it was, some lame reason to get rid of her as well. So they're cutting ties. They said no honor amongst thieves, even when it comes to family or, you know, um, fam friends of family kind of thing. So this guy, of course, is devastated as well. So when I left Hillsong, I went to a small church. It didn't have all the fancy stuff, but it did have the unconditional love that I'd always been looking for. So 2010 to 2016. I found okay. it there. And that really feels like what Jesus was about, being open and loving to everyone. So this poor guy's going to remain deceived. He's going to remain deceived because nobody's going to tell him any different. It's not become a healthy organization. It's a system of abuse. And without that system, it's not Hillsong. It's a regular church. It this woman, Tanya Levin, she was in it from the very beginning. Witnessed it all from the very beginning. I, I guess it was like 2010 to 2018 time frame. And so some people left in like 2016. They got out before all the investigations started in 2018 or what have you. But this woman, she was there, I believe, in Australia as well as New York. So she witnessed the whole thing. And now she's a podcaster and basically whistleblower. And these are the people telling their stories now. But she says some very interesting things. I have levels of success and reach that it has if it's going to treat people properly, keep children safe, pay staff appropriately, have a quality. You know, you can't turn the Manson family into the Brady Bunch. <laughs> can't turn the Manson family into the Brady Bunch. Wow. Okay, and this poor man, he was the one that was abused, sexually abused by Frank the pedophile Houston, the founder of this whole organization. And he tells his story about how when he was upstairs trying to sleep or whatever and the family's all downstairs, the pedophile would come up and he would call it the black shadow because he would just see horrifying for this poor young man, horrifying. And he carries this with him. He's probably in his 60s now, you know? And uh, anyway, the black shadow would come into his room and kind of stand at the doorway. And of course, he's terrified. He doesn't know what he's seeing. He doesn't know what it is. And then the black shadow would lay on top of him. These people are sick. They're twisted. They're demented. And this is what happened to these people. And now, like I said, it's all coming to light. So... Yeah, listening to his testimony was really, really disturbing. Um, these people are just, they're just so sick, these pedophiles. Make me want to puke. It's because David Cowdery, survivor of Frank family, Houston. And if there was somebody else who might have been abused by Frank, maybe he knew me, maybe he knew me, then they would talk to me. For those that Frank Houston paid, on a recognition of what they've been through, I think is really important. 
they've carried this their entire lives. It's a stone thrown into a pond, but the ripples never stop. There is no healing there. Brian Houston has the influence uh, to create uh, a space where some sort of truth can be found. And I don't think he's done that. Whatever happens with Hillsong, whatever happens with Brian Houston, they have provided a template for churches all around the world for charismatic Christians to exploit and to convert their personal charisma into financial acquisitions. That doesn't end with Brian Houston. I think that what Hillsong has shown is the model is scalable and profitable. You can do it everywhere and people will eat it up. The mega church construct is forever going to be part of our lives. This whole contemporary Christian culture, it needs to be dismantled in some way and reborn as something else. The church is people. The church is community. The church should be people caring about each other. And that honestly doesn't have to have anything to do with Jesus, God, or anybody else. <laughs> Unreal. Okay, I'll read this to you because I know it's kind of hard to see. It says, At its height, Hillsong boasted locations in 30 countries around the world and over 150,000 congregates. Wow. And I think the height, like I said, was like, 2010 to like around 2018 most of the people probably left in um like 2016 time frame as of march 2023 six out of 16 u.s locations remain yeah, they had them everywhere. They talked about um, New York, Boston, Dallas, and Kansas City. But I know there were a lot more, but those are the ones I remember them talking about. Hillsong, New York currently has around 500 congregants per week. To date, there are 13 alleged victims and survivors of Frank Houston. So that's 13, mostly boys, I believe, that this pedophile destroyed. The verdict for Brian Houston's court trial for the alleged concealment of child sex abuse is expected in June 2023. Now... You have to, like I said, watch the whole thing. But the Royal Commission, um, like the tribunal type thing, they could come up with other, you know, uh, convictions as well. And I can only imagine, even if he escapes criminal court, how many civil lawsuits would be filed against this guy for ruining all the lives that he did. So hiding the child sex abuse, you know, of his father is one thing. But... He also, you know, it, it's not criminal, but he also, you know, had two extramarital affairs. Um, you know, uh, you know, th man, Hellsong really has nothing on the mob, okay? I mean, I don't think they, you know, hire Vinny the leg breaker, you know, or Joey the cleaner, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but at the same time, I mean, they're not really in the gambling and prostitution and drug dealing, but you do have drugs and alcohol involved in these things. You do have a lot of pedophilia. You do have a lot of groping. You do have a lot of, you know, uh, impropriety and, and moral failings. And, you know, in cover-ups, major cover-ups, concealment, everything is a cover-up from this organization. Um, so as June, this month commences, this trial commences, and then um, malfeasance is another thing. 
uh, he's going to have to answer for a lot of where the funds went to uh, because, <laughs> oh man, it was like a pyramid scheme. They actually had this thing where like the Admiral's Club or something, you know, you give a certain amount, you can have coffee with the pastor or whatever. You're at this level, this tier, the golden tier or whatever, and the platinum tier and all the rest of this garbage, like a credit card. It's ridiculous, you know? So that's kind of how they, they, they set it up as far as the tithing goes. And then one part that they didn't have at the end here, which is also very important, getting back to the scarlet letter thing, is when this whole uh, scandal broke and the investigation started from Vanity Fair and the journalists in Australia and the whistleblowers and the podcasters and so forth all got together and compared notes and shared notes and these um, these victims of, of Frank Houston came forward and so forth. When all that start to ha started to happen, they still had Hellsong College going in Australia and they, and they may have had satellite cam campuses in the U.S. as well. But in Australia, they still had the college. But when the students went back to school that year, they basically, the leadership, or lack thereof, pretty much bring them in, their room, bring them in the room, and they ask them all kinds of very personal questions, um, you know, relating to their character or maybe skeletons in their closet, things that they don't want anybody to know about, you know, that should only basically be between, between them the, the Lord God, you know, our Lord and Savior Jesus, or, you know, maybe a counselor in certain instances, but really not anybody else's business, and ask them very personal questions, and dependent upon how they answer, because these students try to have integrity, you know, they try to be honest, they believe that the truth was going to set them and make them free, but in this case, these people use the truth against them. And then in their ID cards or whatever, you know, they would put like a little red dot or something. And that was like the scarlet letter that basically meant this person has sin in their life that they're working on that they need to get over. It could be, you know, they would ask them anything like, have you had premarital sex? You know, I don't want to get into all of it, but it's sex related things, um, you know, kind of like if you're you know, going under the microscope as a psychological exam or polygraph exam or whatever, and being interviewed by a psychiatrist if you're trying to get in law enforcement or get some type of top security clearance or whatever. They ask you the most personal questions, you know, and they expect you to answer truthfully, and then they use it against you. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did to these poor college students. So they basically made them all wear scarlet letters. So a lot of these kids dropped out of college because who wants to walk around with the red dot on your ID and everybody knows, oh, you, you, you have a problem with fornication or you have a problem with whatever, or you have a problem with this or problem with that. Really twisted, man, just twisted. But just a bunch of hypocrites because <clears throat> Frank Houston, or no, excuse me, Brian Houston, he gets rid of Carl Lentz. And like I said, I, I, I don't really care. But at the same time, other people were doing the other, other things and, you know, in Australia or wherever else, and they get a free pass, you know. So it, it just depended upon how much attention that you had brought to yourself or how important you were in their so-called ministry to see if you got a free pass or you get canned. So very, very hypocritical. At the same time, Brian Houston is having extramarital affairs. And, you know, of course, his wife, you know, she's involved in this whole thing. And she's stand by her man kind of thing, you know. And uh, Bobby is her name. And, um, you know, it's just sad. It's just sad and sickening. <laughs> Additional criminal charges are expected in regard to Hillsong's alleged financial malfeasance. Yep, there we go. He's got to account for all this money that these people thought that they were giving to the so-called ministry. and He's spending it on lavish gifts, watches, trips, jet skis, you name it. Oh yeah, it's all in there.
Sources inside the Australian government believe Hillsong's charity status may be revoked and laws regulating tax exemptions for charities will be reviewed. Imagine that. Hillsong did not respond to multiple requests for interviews. Shocking. Citing ongoing legal matters, Brian Houston declined an on-camera on interview. Okay. So, like I was saying before, and you know what? I think I forgot to turn the chat on, and I apologize for that. That was not my intention. But anyway, like I was saying before, um, people can get upset. Not saying you all on the chat or whatever, but other messages I've gotten, emails and comments and stuff. They can get upset for me exposing this stuff if they want to, and other people. They can get mad. That, that's fine. But the bottom line is this. It's about trying to keep people from deception and warning people to stay away from these cult leaders. These people that people have become to... I don't want to necessarily say idolize, but let's just say they look at them as some type of a hero. These people are hirelings, man. And here's one Here's one that just came out. A lot of people don't like Drew Bloom, but I like him. You know, people don't like him. They think he's too harsh. He's too mean. Same with, um, what's his name? Name escapes me right now. Bruce Peters. But uh, anyway... These people are just trying to, te to keep people from being deceived and hurt. Now, check, out th check this out. Here's another exposure. Robin Bullock, okay? News 13 in Birmingham, Alabama did this report uh, because his church in, I guess, in Warrior, Alabama, it's called, a church international or whatever. Check this out. Listen to this. Here's another one. The hirelings are everywhere. And then I said, I, I, and I call this, Today, pride goes before the fall and falling to pieces because you saw how Carl Lentz and Brian Houston, Carl Lentz already went down. Brian Houston's probably going to go down in a major, major way. Hellsong hopefully will no longer exist soon. Who knows? But God is definitely, you know, exposing. He's bringing things into the light now. People may have seen that church in uh, Spencer, Massachusetts that s said they were going to celebrate Pride Month. Next thing you know, it gets hit by lightning and the church catches on fire. See, the Lord's not playing games anymore, especially this month. And I'll get into more of that later. But this guy, this hireling, you know, Robin Bullock, check this guy out. I mean, rock star Billy Ray Cyrus lookalike clown. Unbelievable. But, uh, yeah, so... Let's just listen to this. I'll just fast forward it to the uh, interview. John 10, 13, the hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. Yep. All right, this isn't up. So we're going to listen to a report they did on tonight's news. May 29th, 2023, and we're going to comment as we go. And I implore you to watch my entire video here because I'm going to show you the difference between a scamming, show you the difference between a scamming, cult, narcissistic, fake church compared to a true biblical church. And it's very moving. So stay tuned for that. But right now, let's, uh, let's watch the clip that aired on the news tonight. Brittany Dunn. Jason, thank you. The warrior community is taking the phrase, love thy neighbor, to another level. A California woman recently trekked to the city after she believes Church International. Leaders there led her to move there, but when she got to the door, things didn't go as expected. WVTM 13's Magdalene Lusant has her story. 82-year-old Janet Degua seems to be in good spirits, despite living in an unfamiliar territory for over a week. Claiming to Jesus. Grateful that I can and enjoying every minute of it. Debwa, a retired social worker from California, says she felt led to move to Warrior after she says she heard Church International's pastor say so. She's been following the ministry for a few years. The invitation that was given on YouTube 
was essentially this. He was saying, if you find that you have a kindred spirit with what I'm sharing with you and with what I do, you know, what I say, come. She took a three-day bus trip to Warrior, and when she arrived on May 21st, she says she was met with hesitancy by a church staff member. If they make a call like that, I'm just assuming all the staffing would know. So I was at a loss to figure out what was going on. But I wasn't going to press her. It was like, had I gone to penniless, that might have been a different story. People in Warrior have quickly learned of Devois' story. She's currently staying with a couple while others help her find a permanent home. I've grown to love this little place in the little time that I've been here. The people in certain life. Grateful of the neighborly love, she's learning why she was truly called to the city. Things may not could, could have turned differently, but I never got a chance to enter that door. And that may have been a good thing. My prayer is that your city will not be altered in any way because it's a beautiful place. And like I said, what I saw there is to be treasured. We've reached out to church leaders at Church International for an interview and statement and haven't heard back. In Warrior, I'm Magda Lobisant, WBTM 13. Right, so they reached out to the church and they didn't respond. That's Robin, Robin, Bullock. They didn't respond. And again, shocking, but not shocking. Now, if you saw my first report, it was on last week's Friday for Eclipse. Lee Hedgepath, this is the guy that wrote the first article. This is a follow-up to that first article. And so what happened, essentially, and I'm not going to go too much into this, Robin got wind of was this guy, the Daniel? article. And this is what he said in his service last week. Quote, this is Robin talking. And we have cowardly people standing behind keyboards developing hit pieces on everything they can just to cause, uh, just to cause division in the body. That's all it's about. Is it not a hit piece? Is it not a new type of assassination? Really? What a drama queen. Assassins? where they can finally develop social media sites where they can block everything but their own narrative? Because truth that's hidden is truth that's rewritten. And this was Robin Bullock as he spoke in front of the church on May 28, 2023. But look what Lee writes here. The Bullocks and Church International did not respond to multiple requests for comment before the publication of Thursday's piece. So what Robin's doing here and this is cult 101 cult leader behavior, is he's playing the victim. He's going to cry persecution. He's going to call people like Lee Hedge uh, assassin, an assassin, basically. When he was contacted multiple times, and he chose, he chose as a, an alleged leader of the church of Jesus Christ, he chose not to respond. And a pattern here because he chose not to respond to channel 13 either it is absolutely astonishing so the question is why doesn't robin respond well because he's fake he's not a real church nor is his wife nor are all the players all the actors i should say in the background this is a family rock and roll band that scams the earth via the internet. He does not care for the sons and daughters of God Almighty. What he cares about is putting on a good show, making sure that his leather looks crisp and clean, that he's got his wizard staff <laughs> and his hair scrunchy, and he puts on the show. This is what the Bible calls a hireling. Now, I would tell you, because I'm, I, I am ranting here a little bit, there are people out there that care about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Robin Bullock is not one of them. I can't imagine if I had a church where anyone, much less an 82-year-old woman who traveled 2,000 miles in a Greyhound bus, showed up and this type of situation developed. I can't imagine not dropping everything that I was doing to run to any news organization that reported this or anyone that would even tell me of this 
to quickly remedy the situation and help this person, Janet and Dagwa, any way that I could. For crying out loud, this is what the church exists for. And this man refuses to be a man and to take care of this. It is unbelievable. And I pray that more people would get a hold of this and expose this because this is a travesty. Robin Bullock unequivocally is a hireling and he has demonstrated this in full public view. And he doesn't care. If you want to see do. the coldest of the coldest hearts, you're looking at him right here. As long as he can play his guitar, right? Oh, now you got to pick up the shofar, blow the shofar, because people love this. This gets the checks coming in. This gets the MasterCards and the Visa cards going. Yeah, unbelievable. So there's my rant. Now, what I'm going to show you is a contrast, and you're going to hear something incredible here. A real church. Watch this clip that I'm going to play for you right now. So from time to time, our church will have people just wander up and spend the night right here on these benches at our front door. And we are 100% good for that. I have to admit that when we made these benches, that's not exactly what we had in mind. But God's never about what we had in mind. And I sure am glad. Now when this stuff does happen, our security cameras pick it up and we always leave them alone until the sun comes up. And once the sun comes up, one of us, and sometimes a few of us, will get together and make sure they're all right. We make sure they're fed and their basic needs are taken care of. Now the most recent one happened this week and several of the guys actually joined us. We had breakfast together and we sat around and talked about life for well over an hour. I'm so thankful to be surrounded by people that are more interested in being the church than having church. You see, this guy, he's someone's son. But more importantly, he is a child of God. And if that were my son, I would hope that someone was showing compassion. See, because our job is not to judge and condemn him, our job is to embrace him, love him, and help provide for him. But it's really got me to thinking this week. Anything we do inside this building is pointless. If we don't live it outside this building, it doesn't matter how wonderful the songs that we sing in here are. If we don't sing that song out here as well, it doesn't matter how good the sermon in here is. If the sermon out here that we preach is the exact opposite. If we're known more by what happens inside these walls than what we do outside of them, then that's a problem. I think we're going to build more benches that are inside and cushioned with a shower so we can love on more people. Isn't that incredible? Absolutely incredible. The first time I saw that clip, uh, I was moved to tears. Now, to be fair, I don't know who this man is. I don't know what church this is. All I know is uh, that when he spoke, I heard the Holy Spirit. And uh, he's helping people. He's helping homeless people. In case you didn't understand what he was saying, they put these Sorry, new benches outside in. his church. And uh, looks like some homeless people were showing up and you know sleeping on these benches. And uh, he took them in and he helps people. And he feeds people, makes sure that they have what they need, because, as he said, they're sons of God, they're daughters of God. And this is what a church is supposed to do, not what Robin Bullock has done. What an absolute tragedy, what a travesty when it comes to Robin Bullock. And the, and the funny thing here is Robin Bullock behaves the same way as all the corrupt politicians in Washington, D.C. behave. This is what Robin spends the majority of his time railing against, and he actually behaves worse because he's doing it in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, he makes his living lying in the name of Jesus Christ. Who do you think is going to be in more trouble on Judgment Day? I shudder, as I said before, I tremble and shudder for Robin Bullock for what he's doing. Just terrible. Forgive me, this is my rant. I'm ranting a little bit. Certainly pray for Robin Bullock. I do pray for him that he would come to the truth of Jesus Christ and put away his rock star, idol, fake church and come to the truth of Jesus Christ. But in the meantime, I also pray that God would shut his ministry down because he is actively shipwrecking the faith of an un, untold number worldwide as his filth is broadcast through the internet all over the world. 
He's shipwrecking faith. He is exactly who Jesus warned you about in Matthew 24. For many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. This is Robin. Continue to pray for Janet and Degwa. Precious lady, there's been talk that she's a Jehovah's Witness. I don't know. I don't know. All I know is that if I had a church and an 82-year-old showed up at my church that just came 2,000 miles, I'd open the door for her. I'd say, get in here. Let's get you fed, get you the things you need, just like that one pastor was saying. And then we, then we would focus on doctrine, perhaps. I don't know all the details. I just know that you help your brother and sister. But pray for her. Pray for the brave citizens of Warrior, Alabama, who have to endure this nutcase, Robin Bullock. So I guess I'll end my rant there. For those of you that love Jesus Christ in truth and sincerity, God bless you. Okay, I have one more for you all. This is very, very interesting. Being that we are in June, Pride Month, as they refer to it. Let me get to see if there's an okay. ad. There is, okay. Um, this is a very interesting mystery that Jonathan Kahn reveals here. It's not about Jonathan Kahn. Just listen to what he says and regarding what not long ago I gave you he's addressing Biden and he has three mysteries that he reveals that are based on historical biblical fact and it refers even though the what is it respect for marriage act was signed back in December they're going to be celebrating the perversion of marriage and already are. Uh, and all the sodomy and all the, the just sexual perversion and this agenda and everything all throughout this month. Everything's gay in June, right? So, <clears throat> and like in, in the uh, eastern Tennessee area, it pretty much starts in June 9th. And it kind of carries on throughout all the way up till june 25th is the thing that i saw where a catholic church called the good samaritan church is basically going to be doing a pride mass type thing so boy that's stupid as a matter of fact you know anybody going to any of these parades or festivals i would say they're stupid i don't think i would be testing god anymore especially this month i really don't i don't think i'd test his patience i don't think i'd test his mercy i don't think i'd test his grace we are flaunting our sin and our sexual perversion in his face. And I don't know that we get away with it anymore. I'm not exactly sure yet. But I find it very interesting that the Brian Houston trial continues in June. Okay? And he's all about pride. You watch the whole thing. That's The, the dude, kind of like what Drew Bloom just said, these people play the victim. They're very good at playing the victim, you know and making people feel sorry for them. And they don't apologize, they don't ask for forgiveness, they just make excuses and they explain things away. But they're very good at playing the victim. And all these politicians and all of these cult leaders, they're hirelings, they, they, they're very good at that. And what Jonathan Kahn says here, referring to this mystery is extremely important because it could very well have something to do with June, with this month. I don't know for sure, but listen to what he says. Listen to how and when these things were signed into law and what it reveals about Mystery Babylon, the times that we're in now, and specifically this month of June, because I know it's worldwide, but this is Mystery Babylon because of everyone flaunting their sexual perversion in God's face. We'll see what happens. But listen to what Jonathan Kahn says here. A word concerning what you did on the White House lawn by signing the Respect for Marriage Act. Today, I give you a mystery. Actually, three mysteries. One especially for you, one especially for those watching, and one more. And you're actually part of all three, even though you had no idea. It's a mystery, it's a secret that goes back thousands of years to the ancient Middle East. 
and yet you manifested it on the lawn and the walls of the White House. It's also a sign from God. Not long ago, you became the first president in American history to enshrine into federal law the alteration of marriage, to destroy the definition of marriage as it has always stood, to abolish its biblical, historic meaning. You did it by signing the, quote, Respect for Marriage Act, but the Respect for Marriage Act was actually aimed at destroying another law, the Defense of Marriage Act, that you yourself had voted for. So you destroyed the Defense of Marriage Act, and by signing the Respect for Marriage Act, you sought to force all Americans to bend their knee before the destruction of the historic and biblical definition of marriage, and to sanctify its alteration. And you rejoiced in the act. You rejoiced in the act of destruction with a mass celebration on the White House lawn. You sealed it all that night by lighting up the White House in the colors of the rainbow. Mr. President, you call yourself a Christian. You were raised to say prayers to the God of the Bible. But do you actually have any real fear of God? That he's actually real? He's actually alive? If so, how could you possibly have done what you did? You have to know that God's word clearly identifies this as sin and transgression against it. And yet you enshrined it, you hallowed it, you held a celebration in his honor, you sought to force the nation to respect that which God's word calls darkness. Do you not fear judgment, or do you think that God is silent and not able to act? Well, he is not silent, and he's actually answered what you have done. There's only one place in the Bible where God does not respect marriage. It was the day when he judged the marriages of Israel that were made in sin against his will. He judged it in a gathering held in the capital city, just as you signed the Respect for Marriage Act in a gathering in the capital city. And even though those marriages in ancient times were given sanction and legitimacy by man, God said they were of sin and not legitimate. It was the day that in the Bible that focused on the marriages that the Israelites had entered into but were exposed as not legitimate. They were unholy and sinful. So, what was that day? That day was the 20th day of the biblical month of Kislev, the 20th of Kislev. Mr. President, when you lit up the White House as a rainbow to seal and celebrate what you did that day, the Respect for Marriage Act, God answered you. God spoke. God put up his own seal, his own sign. You see, when you sealed and celebrated what you did that day by lighting up the White House as a rainbow on the night of December 13th, you actually did it on the biblical date of the 20th day of Kislev, the biblical day that exposes sinful unions, unions of sin. You sealed the Respect for Marriage Act that day on the one day in the Bible on the calendar, Kislev 20, that is specifically dedicated to the marriages that God cannot respect and that were answered by national repentance. How did that happen? You didn't plan it that way. Nobody under staff did, but you see, God, whose ways you disregard and overturn, is actually alive and well, and is not silent, and he has spoken. What happened at the White House was a brazen act of defiance of God by the leader of this nation. But as you sealed that act, the God of the Bible, the God who is alive and well, put his own seal on it. You see, God always has the last word. Second mystery. You lit up the White House in the colors of the rainbow, but... The rainbow does not belong to you or any man or any movement. The rainbow belongs to God. It's a sacred sign signifying his mercy in the face of judgment. And it's a sign of his throne. But as president of the United States, you took that sacred sign of God and turned it against the God to whom it belongs. But there's more to it. You see, it actually has to do with an ancient deity, a goddess, a spirit. Just before you did this, I released my last book, The Return of the Gods, that reveals the entities, the spirits that are taking possession of America. One of those ancient gods or spirits was called the Enchantress. From ancient times, she was connected to a sign. Do you know what it was? The rainbow. And you know what she was the goddess of? Sexual licentiousness, sexual immorality. Her ancient hymns declare that she has the power to turn a man into a woman and a woman into a man. Boom. She's the goddess that bends uh, sexuality, blurs, merges gender. She breaks the line. She breaks the distinction between man and woman, male and female, boy and girl. It is this spirit which is now taking possession of our culture. And on the day that you redefine marriage, you place her sign on the nation's highest house, the White House.
house, the sign of the goddess. You were in effect placing the nation into her hands, her ownership, her possession, a demonic possession. You call yourself a Christian, but you took the sacred sign of God, the sign he gave of mercy instead of judgment, and turned it against him on the White House. Do you fear judgment for what it is to invoke judgment on the nation you are supposed to lead? I promised you three mysteries, the third and last one. This one is not only assigned to you, but to every believer in this land. Those who defend religious liberty warned that the Respect for Marriage Act, even though a clause was added to give lip service to religious liberty, was actually setting a dangerous precedent and setting the stage and opening the door to the ending of religious liberty in this land. Oh, man. Seriously? I thought we were going to get through the whole thing. Well, thank you, Lord, that at least the ads have not been too insane today. <laughs> Never know what to You expect. and your administration denied it. And then your press secretary implied that actually removing the clause for religious liberty was on the agenda for the days ahead. Now, there was a day recorded in the Bible when an ancient king in his capital city, in effect, sealed, signed into federal law and edict that was to lead to an attack, to the attack of God's people, the persecution of God's people throughout the land. Now, you as president signed into federal law an act that specifically called on individuals to fight those who would not recognize the marriages and unions that God does not recognize. Could what you signed into federal law on the White House end up unleashing an error of attacks on religious freedom, on religious organizations, on God's people? Could it bring persecution? Could there be a sign, a mystery, a revelation that gives us the answer? In the biblical account of the king who gave his approval, his seal, on the law that opened the door for the attacks of God's people, against God's people, persecution, it identifies a specific day on which this was to happen. What was that day? Linked to the persecution of God's people. The account reads, quote, the 13th day of the 12th month. Now that was for Israel on Israel's calendar, but translate that to America. Mr. President, you signed that law on the White House on December 13th. In other words, you signed that law on the 13th day of the 12th month, the same day as in the Bible account, the ancient king. You gave your seal of approval on an edict, a law, as in the account, that was for the persecution, would end up bringing persecution and calamity and destruction to the people of God on the 13th day of the 12th month. Again, again, God is actually alive. He's not silent, and he is stronger than kings or presidents. And again, he has the last word. Mr. President, on the day you stand before God, the laws that you signed into existence will not exist. But his law will exist, and by his law, you will be judged. Repent. Be saved. And for you, the people of God who are watching this, what do you do in light of these things? Stand strong. Stand firm. Be strong and of good courage. Do not bow down your knee to Baal or any other god of this age. And do not be silent, because the laws of man will pass away, but the laws of God will remain forever. Do not fear the future. The future belongs to God. No matter what happens in the world, in our culture, in our nation, remember this. God always will have the last word. And if the dark is getting darker, it's time for the lights of God to shine even more brightly. When evil goes from bad to worse, the light has to go from good to great. It's time to be bold for God. It's time to be great for God. For thus says the Lord, arise and shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has risen upon you. This is Jonathan Kahn. Be strong and of good courage. Shalom. Okay. <clears throat> Pretty fascinating stuff, I think. <laughs> and uh, timely, too. And uh, let me just say this before I get out of here. I love confirmation. I've told people that many times, and uh, anybody who's been listening to me for any length of time, if you're new here, or you might watch this later. I've pretty much been doing this, maybe not these live streams, but been on YouTube making videos, doing live streams, sharing things and community page 
almost on a daily basis now for the last six years. Eight, if you include the time on Facebook and other social media sites, but um, Instagram and things of that nature. But on YouTube, as a regular, I guess you could say, pretty much on a daily basis, with very few exception. I'd say at least three, four times, if not more, a week. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I've been around for a while. I've been doing this for, for a while now. I mean, if you think about it, it's almost been like a full-time job. But um, I love confirmation because confirmation, it, it leads me to believe that what I'm doing is correct and what I need to be doing is what I need to be doing and it's not coming from me. And uh, it's to the point where I usually don't even have to pray for confirmation. It just comes. It just comes. It usually comes in the form of an email, a text message, something somebody will share with me, uh, you know, maybe put a video out, something of that nature. But it just comes. And it usually comes just a few hours, if not, you know, before I'm, you know, I decide to to come on live or to make a video or what have you. And the, and the interesting thing about it is the people that send me things or communicate with me in that way, they don't know. I, I don't share um, anything that I'm thinking of doing or that the Lord lays on my heart uh, before I do it. I hardly ever share it with anyone, even including my wife. Uh, a lot of times I, I just don't share it with anyone. They don't know what I'm going to talk about or what I'm going to, you know, present in a video format. I mean, so it's amazing to me how these things come about. And after watching this Jonathan Kahn video, which I believe was sent to me, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, my wife brought the, the Secret of Hillsong thing to my attention, and I ignored that for a while. I said, oh, that looks interesting. You know, I might check it out eventually. And I had no idea it was a four-part series, you know, so it took me a while to get through it all. But, you know, uh, but I didn't know how deep the corruption went until I watched that thing. But anyway, after watching the Jonathan Kahn thing, th this video I just showed you all, I was reminded of some things. I've been reminded of it for a while, but it brought back to my memory. Angela, Narrow Road 79K, said back in before April that that would be a month of accountability and justice. And it was. It was. If people want to look back at it, it was. You have to kind of research it. But yes, things did come to light. Sins were revealed of politicians, of leaders, of celebrities, Things, you know, pastors or what have you, cult leaders, things began to be revealed. What I didn't know is it was going to continue. And it has. It continued through May, and now we're into June. And that Hell Song thing got released. The last thing was like, I think, May 26th or 28th. It was the last episode. So it's like they intentionally put it out, and they probably did in May prior to the trial of Brian Houston commencing in June. So the timing was perfect on that. But I remember Angela saying that, Narrow Road 79K, and I kind of committed it to my memory. And then in the same token, in his video, Silence in Heaven, and I think after that, uh, Edward Umling talked about certain things happening you know, during you know, certain months. And when he got to June, he mentioned double portion in June. And that's interesting because a double portion could be a double portion of judgment and or a double portion of blessings. And I think it could be both. We'll see. I mean, what's only like June 5th? I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens, what commences in this month. But And then he talked about by July 4th, the Lord would say goodbye to Mystery Babylon. So that kind of leads me to believe that some things are going to go down in June, leading us up to July 4th time frame, um, where there's not going to be repentance. There's not going to be any humility. There's the, these, these uh, homo fests. I don't care if it offends people. I, I really don't. These homo fests will be, um, you know, will not be canceled. Uh, 
But I'm not, don't think this will happen, but I wouldn't be surprised if there's not a Sodom and Gomorrah type judgment because I do think the Lord is fed up with this. I think he's put up with it long enough, this, this satanic agenda that every year in this particular month, and even after that or before that, people just flaunt their sexual perversion in front of God's face like he's not going to do anything about it. Well, Brazil found out differently a few months ago when they decided to mock Jesus and worship Satan, and he flooded Brazil after their festival, and other places have found out differently. So I'm not saying fire and brimstone are going to rain down from heaven on these homo fests. I'm not saying that. Wouldn't surprise me if it did. Wouldn't surprise me if it did. I, I, I'm not saying that. But I do believe that there could definitely be some type of judgment upon these cities, uh, towns, and the fest festivals themselves. For the and that's most of this nation that is going to engage in this garbage throughout this month, you know, culminating with what I'm going to get into now, a major one on June 25th in New York City. Now I'm not going to I'm not going to say names because that's not that's not cool. <laughs> okay, I don't want to embarrass anybody and I don't want anybody coming back at me. So I'm not going to say names. All right, but I will tell you that. Just last night, I got home from work, and as often as the case, I can't really get to bed right away. You know, I just, I just can't. It takes me a while to settle down. I checked my phone. I had 11 text messages. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I was like, all right. Well, most of them was from the same person because they were sharing a lot of attachments uh, and, and, and things. And I'm like, okay, this is cool. So I'm thinking, this is 11 people I, I got to respond to. But no, it, most of them were from the same person. So that was cool. But anyway, they um, they shared with me, and I, I, I don't pay attention to many visions and dreams and words of knowledge and this or that. I mean, I used to, but I don't anymore because a lot of them kind of are copycats. They say the same type of things, or it's pretty obvious to me. You know, it's like, war is coming. Wow, thanks. I couldn't have figured that one out on my own. I mean, not to be a jerk or anything, but I mean, it was just, it just seemed like it was the same thing always over and over and over again. So I, I hardly listen to any, but there are a few people that I know, a few people I'm in contact with, when they share things with me, I pay attention to it because I believe there's legitimacy there and I know that they've been right in the past. So they shared something with me, a vision that they had from 2020. And uh, I believe it was April, I'm not exactly sure, I'd have to look it up again, but sometime in 2020 that they had a vision, they were given a vision of um, basically destruction on New York City and it was around the time of pride. They, they saw all the, all, the, all the flags, the rainbow flags waving and so forth and they we're not given, you know, a, a date or a year or anything of that nature, but this was back in 2020. Well, then it was this year of April 2023, they were given a word of knowledge that kind of confirmed that vision from three years prior. And they opened up their Bible, and I think it was Jeremiah 13, and at the top, it said something about pride, you know, and how the sin of pride basically will not be ignored by by our lord and i thought i found it very interesting that they had that vision back in 2020 then received awarded knowledge in april of 2023 confirming that vision now nobody's saying anything's going to happen in new york you know in this june or anything of that nature or anywhere else it's just that what they saw and their in their vision and the word of knowledge had to do with flags, the pride flags, the rainbow flags waving and so forth, and people were celebrating their perversion. And that is when the destruction came. Um, and it was specifically on New York in this case. Uh, so their festival is on June 25th. Um, so I don't know. Neither do they. We'll see. Nobody's prophesying anything. They were just sharing with me what they saw and the word of knowledge they were given 
that it's very possible that the Lord won't put up with it this year. It's very possible. And then when I think about the accountability, the, the hell song thing, you know, it, it's all it's all connected. The pedophilia, you know, the the exposure, the the pride, uh, the the sin of pride, you know, their failure to admit that they've done wrong, or specifically Brian Houston and you know, just doubling down on his innocence and so forth, only admitting what he has to admit to, but not contrite, not repentant, not asking for forgiveness, not anything of that nature, just excusing his behavior basically, playing the victim, the whole the Robin Bullock clown, and there's so many other hirelings out there, you know. All of this is connected. It's connected to pride. It's connected to, you know, it, 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 it's connected to sexual immorality. It's connected to perversion. It's all connected. And now that we're in that month of June, we shall see. And then when I think about what Edward Umling said, July 4th, the Lord says goodbye. And because over the last several years, you know, we've had all of this sexual perversion and this stuff thrown in our face in June, and then we celebrate America on July 4th and our independence, where I've always, you know, I've had it spoken to my heart that we're, what we're really celebrating is our independence from God. Our independence to say, we can do, we're our own God, we can do what we want, when we want, how we want, and we really don't care what He wants. That's pretty much what July 4th has become. People say, oh, that's not true, that's not fair, that's not this, that's not that. Well, the proof is in the pudding. How do you celebrate, you know, a month of sexual perversion and insanity and chaos and pedophilia and, you know, hurting our children mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually, and then July 4th sing all of these great songs and, and fireworks and celebrate your independence you know, while you were Sodom and Gomorrah the month before, and now you're America a few days later. I mean, you talk about being bipolar, not making fun of anybody who's bipolar, has any kind of disorder or anything like that. But that's what that is. That's insanity. That's chaos. To, to, to celebrate, become, be Sodom and Gomorrah one month, and then to say, we love, God bless America the next. Really? I mean, God's not stupid. You don't think he doesn't see this? I mean, if, if I can see it, and I'm not very intelligent, and other people can see it, I know he sees it. So it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. So anyway, uh, last thing, you know, it, 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 it's very painful to see a lot of the things that are happening now. And the things people are sending me. And a lot of this stuff is on Rumble and BitChute. It, it can't be on YouTube. It can't be on Instagram or Facebook. It'll get censored. It'll get banned. So a lot of things are like on Rumble and BitChute. Of, you know, and it's suppressed by the media and so forth. And, and now we're seeing all connected again. All coming together again. The, the choices that people have made over the last several years to inject their bodies with bioweapons, bioterror weapons, and so forth. And now we're seeing what is coming of that. And I, people have sent me video after video after video of people just falling out, falling out, falling out. One woman had a, had a daughter, had her daughter in her arms or whatever, falling out in stores. Parents dying right in front of their children. People freaking out, having seizures. People happy acting zombie-like behavior. Yeah, it could be like fentanyl and trank and all the rest of that stuff. But I think it's deeper than that. It's a demonic possession. Like Jonathan Kahn was saying, you know, we're we are now controlled by this enchantress. In, in, enchantress, I think is what he said, you know, of sexual perversion. And now, you know, connected again. All of these things, which is basically disobedience to God, is what it really will boil down to. I am my own God. I can do what I want, when I want, how I want. It's my body, my choice. I can put whatever in it I want to, blah, blah, blah. Well, there are consequences. There are ramifications for that. And now we're seeing them. And if you're not seeing them, you will. 
And if you got the things that I was getting that people are sending me, the researchers that I know that send me from Rumble and BitChute and all the rest of these things, and you're watching these videos, and this isn't all staged and this isn't all planned, you know, this is real life stuff. People are dying, they're dropping like flies left and right because of the choices and the decisions they made. And it's horrible to see, it's horrible to witness. And one person has sent me this, they said, you were right all along. And I said, well, you know what? I said, it's not about being right and it's not about being wrong. It was about being obedient to the Lord and warning people. This channel has always been a truth and information channel. You know, that's what I've always tried to make it. You know, whether people like it or not, agree with it or not, like me, don't like me, that's what it's always been about, you know? And I tried to present the truth. I tried to present it years ago to people. I tried to tell them years ago. I tried to, to inform them years ago. Anybody that's been listening to me for any length of time, you know this is true. I tried with all these walking talks, you know, pointing the phone down at the sidewalk where people just saw sidewalk and cracks in the sidewalk and asphalt. And I was just pouring out my heart and I was just sharing what the Holy Spirit was revealing to me about this. And now it's all coming about. And it's not because I'm smart or I'm a prophet or anything like that. I was just being obedient. I was just being obedient to what the Lord was telling me to do. That's really what it boiled down to. I was just obeying Jesus. I was just obeying God. That was it. And they said, well, it's like, you know, you, you, you didn't lie to us. You, you were, I said, no, I wasn't lying to you. Uh, you know, you were right. I said, I, I said, it's not about being right. It's about warning people, about telling people the truth. It's about, you know, just informing people of what the Lord had put on my heart. And it is, it's heartbreaking, it's heart-wrenching to see it and to hear about it now. And it's all coming together. And it's fascinating to see, you know, the Bible is literally alive. I mean, Jesus' words are jumping off the page now. It is in our faces. We're dealing with it. You know, people are dealing with it in their own families, in their own homes, at their workplaces. Or whatever. Jesus' words are literally jumping off the pages. Th those words in, in, in red are literally jumping off the pages now. I mean, we're living Revelation. We're living Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. We're living it now. And now that's the last thing I wanted to say, too. In the beginning of episode four, the false prophets episode of, of uh, the Hell Song, the Secrets of Hell Song, they talked about how, you know, Brian Houston and these other hirelings or whatever, they use the book of Revelation and they've used Jesus' words to talk about their own persecution. See, look what they're doing to me. Look, Trump did the same thing. What they're doing to me, they're going to do to you. They all play the victim. They all play the victim. And they say, see, Jesus' words are coming to truth in my case, are coming to pass in my case. They're persecuting me. Yeah, well, they're persecuting you because you are hiding the sins of the pedophile father. You know, you're being persecuted for good cause. You're being persecuted because it's justice and accountability. It's not because, you know, stop playing the martyr, stop playing the victim. It's not because, you know, you're laying down your life for the cause of Christ. Give me a break. But these people, they all want to play the victim. They all, all want to play the victim card. Look, I'm being persecuted, I'm being persecuted. Like Drew Bloom said, what a drama queen. Give me a break. Be a man, be a woman. Stop, stop this crap. You know, look at me, I'm being persecuted. Give me a break. You don't know what persecution is. None of us do, yet. But, you know, they always want to play that victim card. They're excellent at it. All these politicians, all these hirelings, all of these cult leaders, they're excellent. And people fall into the trap every single time. Like clockwork. I'm going to go. It's almost 11 o'clock. Let's say one more thing. This right here, Pastor Ben Faircloth, the message from yesterday or Sunday, excuse me, no dogs allowed. I highly recommend people listen to that. It's not what you think. No dogs allowed. Um, it confirms a lot too. And it's no coincidence that that church in Massachusetts, Spencer, Massachusetts, catches on fire. Lightning strikes it. Church catches on fire after they, they, they announce that they're going to celebrate Pride Month. God's like, I don't think so. And it's like, and if you are, you're going to be celebrating in ashes because your church is going to burn. I'm not putting up with this garbage anymore. So be very wise and very careful about who you listen to, what you support, what you're a part of, where you go. 
uh, what you attend, you know, be wise, be smart, plead the blood of Jesus over yourself and your family, you know, don't even leave the house without pleading the blood of Jesus, you know, why, before you get in the car and drive somewhere. This is serious, folks. This is serious stuff. So I hope you see how serious it is from today's stream. Again, I'm sorry I didn't turn on the chat. I thought I did. That's kind of weird, but I, did, I guess I didn't. Either that or nobody has anything to say, which I know that's not true. <laughs> so anyway, with that, I think I'm going to go. Y'all have a very blessed day. Thank you for attending. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing this out if you choose to do that. Thank you for anybody that's going to listen to it later. Maybe learn something from it. Like I said, um, if you have Hulu, you can watch this. Um, it was originally on FX. It's streaming on Hulu now. It might be streaming elsewhere. You might be able to find it for free somewhere. I don't know. You have to research that. But it's a four-part documentary. It's definitely worth your time. Um, you know... Because people need to know how deep the corruption goes in these mega churches and amongst these cult leaders so you don't fall into the trap. So your family don't fall in the trap. So your teenage kids, that's who most of these victims were. Teenage kids. That's when they groom them as teenagers, college kids, teenagers, early 20s. That's when they grab these kids. That's when they get a hold of them. So they don't fall into the trap. All right. That's it. Y'all have a blessed day. Take care. Bye-bye.